So I am looking at the game, the GMT game, Men of Iron, Volume 4, Archibus. Subtitle, The Battles for Northern Italy, 1495 to 1544. GMT Games, 2017. Um, obviously designed by Richard Berg. Um, and I am going to start with the smallest of the battles provided. The Battle of Serignola, Kingdom of Naples, Italy, 28 April, 1503. But before I do that, before I jump into the game, um, I thought I would take a look at what might serve as background, uh, setting, um, something to um, yeah to get my mind into the the period, and I wanted something that was at least a classic or classical look at military affairs in the period. Again, a very broad view. Um, nothing very specific. Um, but yeah, something more broad. So I did find uh, a book by Paul Lacroix, uh, Military and Religious Life in the Middle Ages and at the Period of the Renaissance. So this uh, book, published in 1874. <laughs> 1874. Um, so in this book there is a, a chapter called War and Armies. And so I'm going to pick up the, uh, the text in the back half of the chapter and again to help me, me get my mind into the period. Into the period, into the, the uh, uh, yeah, again the setting. Um, yeah. So until the invention of gunpowder, or rather until that of artillery, the whole art of fortification, says the learned Prosper Merime, consisted in following more or less exactly the traditions handed down by the Romans. The stronghold of the Middle Ages had precisely the same characteristics as the ancient Castellum. The methods of attack against which the engineers had to guard were the assault by escalade, either by surprise or by force of numbers, and the breach caused either by sapping, mining, or by the battering rams of the besiegers. The employment of machines or engines of this description was much less frequent after than before the fall of the Roman Empire when the art of war knew no higher flight than to lay siege to a, piece, to a place or sustain a siege. The first operation of the besiegers was to destroy the outworks of the besieged place, such as the posterns, the barbicans, the barriers, etc. As most of these outworks were built of wood, attempts were generally made to cut them to pieces with hatchets or to set them on fire with arrows, to which were fastened, fastened pieces of burning tow steeped in sulfur or some other incendiary composition. If the main body of the place were not so strongly fortified as to render a successful assault by force impossible, it was usual to attempt an escalade. With this end in view, the moat which was generally uh, literally strewn with caltrops, was filled up with fasci fascines on which letters were reared against the ramparts, while archers on the brink of the ditch protested or protected by mantles stuck in the ground, drove away with their arrows any of the defenders who attempted to show themselves above the parapets or at the loopholes. If the siege, in spite of the efforts of the besiegers, promised to be a long one, a blockade was the sole remaining means of reduction, though this was, though this was uh, a thing difficult to carry out with forces which were not permanent and which were generally far from numerous. It therefore became necessary for the besieger to protect his approaches by wooden, earthen, or even stoneworks constructed under cover of the night and solid and lofty enough to enable his archers to aim right on to the battlements of the besieged place. Wooden towers several stories high were also frequently resorted to, put together piece by piece at the edge of the moat or constructed out of bow, out of bow shot, and subsequently rolled on wheels to the foot of the walls. At the siege of Toulouse in 1218, a machine of this kind was built by the order of Simon, uh, Simon de Montfort, uh, capable of accommodating, according to the ballad of the Albigeois, 
uh, 500 men when the missiles hurled from the higher stories of these t towers, termed Chate in the south, Chats, Chateau, Bretishes, Bretishes <laughs> in the north, had driven the besieged from the ramparts and battlements. A movable bridge was lowered across the moat, and a hand to hand struggle then took place. The besieged, to prevent or retard the approaches of these dreaded towers, were accustomed to hurl immense stones and lighted darts against them, or to undermine or inundate the ground on which they stood, so that, th that their own weight might cause them to topple over. Besides the means we have just described, there still remained the sap and the mine. Miners, equipped with pickaxes, were sent into the ditch under the protection of a body of archers. A sloping roof covered with mantles, mantlets, sheltered them from the missiles of the besieged. They then pierced the wall stone by stone till they had made a hole large enough to allow passage of several soldiers at once while the sappers put the finishing stroke to the aperture. The besieged, observing in what direction the enemy was pursuing his operations, strove to concentrate all his means of defense at this point. Sometimes he attempted to crush the miners with immense stones or pieces of wood. Sometimes he poured molten lead or boiling oil over them. Sometimes, by hastily constructing a fresh wall in rear of the one the miners were breaking through, he gave the latter the trouble of beginning their work all over again, just as they thought it was complete. The mine uh, had this advantage over the sap, that the besieger, being out of sight while engaged in the former method of subterranean work, had every had every uh, chance of surprising the besieged. In order to effect this, an underground gallery was dug as noiselessly as possible and carried beneath the foundations of the ramparts. When the mine had reached the walls, these were propped up with pieces of timber and the earth was dug away until they were supported entirely by this artificial method. Dry vine wood and other inflammable materials were then piled round the props and set on fire so that when the timber was consumed, the walls crumbled down and opened a large breach to the besiegers. Nothing then was left to the garrison but to surrender in order to avoid the horrors of an assault and the sack of the town. The only remedy possessed by a garrison against this last method of attack was to keep a good watch and to endeavor to discover the whereabouts of the mine and neutral neutralize it by a countermine. At the siege of Rennes, in 1356, the governor of the town ordered basins of copper, each containing several globes of the same metal, to be placed all about the ramparts. When these globes were seen to vibrate and tremble at each stroke of the hidden pickaxe, it was easy to guess uh, that the mine was not far off. There was also a body of, that's that's very clever. There was also a body of night watchmen who carefully noted the enemy's movements and who rang the alarm bell at the slightest noise. These watchmen were often replaced by dogs, whose barks, in case of a surprise, gave notice to the garrison. The slow and laborious work of the miner was often advantageously replaced by the more powerful action of certain machines, which may be divided into two distinct classes. The first, intended to be used at close quarters and to make a breach in the wall, comprised several varieties of the ancient battering ram. The second, employed at a distance, were termed Pierre Mangogno. Espringales, yeah, <laughs> um, interesting medieval uh, war engines. The battering ram, which was pro probably well known from the remotest periods, is described in the documents of the Middle Ages pretty much as we see it, um, it figured on the monuments of Nineveh. On Easter Day, says the anonymous author of the Chronicles of the Albigeois, the, quote, the Bosson, the southern name of the battering ram, was placed in position. It is long, iron-headed, straight and pointed, and is so hammered and pierced and smashing that the wall was broken through. But they, the besieged, lowered a loop of rope suspended from a machine, and in this noose the Bosson was caught and retained. End quote. Generally speaking, the battering ram was a long, heavy beam suspended in the center from a kind of massive trussle. 
The end which battered the wall was either covered with an iron hood or pointed with brass. The beam was swung backward and forward by the besiegers, and by dint of striking a wall always in the same spot, it often succeeded in shattering or overthrowing it. At other times the ram, instead of being suspended in an oscillating manner, was mounted on wheels and run forward with great rapidity against the wall to be battered. The chronicle of the Albigeois just quoted, alludes to the head of the ram being caught in a noose. Besides this maneuver, the garrison would hurl stones and pieces of timber upon it in order to break it or to put it out of trim, or else they would strive to deaden its blows by interposing a thick mattress of wool covered with leather between it and the stonework of their stronghold. The machines which they employed to hurl their projectiles seem to have corresponded in nearly every respect with the catapults of the ancients. It was often merely a species of gigantic sling worked by several men in throwing pieces of rock and round masses of stone. The mangagno bricole or trabouche was a kind of square wooden platform made of thick planks laid crosswise, a long beam fastened at its lower end by a revolving axis to the platform was supported at an angle of about 45 degrees by an elevated cross piece resting on two uprights. The distance between the revolving axis and the point of support was about one half of the length of the beam. The latter was then secured in this position by long cords fastened to the front of the platform. The men who managed the brick hole then lowered the beam backwards by a wind, uh, windlass fixed in the rear till it, the beam, formed an obtuse in, instead of an acute angle with the platform until the cord securing it in front was stretched to its utmost tension. While it was in this position, the projectile they wished to cast was placed in the spoon-shaped extremity of the beam. A spring termed declic then released the, released the tension of the windlass and the beam, obeying that of the cord fastened to the front of the platform, swung rapidly forward and hurled the projectile to great distances and to some considerable height. These bricoles were sometimes employed to throw into besieged strongholds the dead bodies of horses and other animals, fireballs and cases of inflammable matter, but they were generally used to shatter the roofs of the buildings inside the walls and to crush the protecting wooden sheds constructed on the ramparts. Their use was still continued long after the invention of gunpowder. In the wars of the 14th century, particularly in the siege, sieges of Tarazonia, Barcelona, and Burgo, Goals were made use of side by side with cannons discharged, discharged with gunpowder. It was not until the close of the 15th century that the rapid progress of the new artillery, which enabled besiegers to breach a wall from a considerable distance and with a smaller expenditure of both time and men, caused the whole paraphernalia of the old fashioned ballistic machines to fall into disuse. Thenceforward, a new era commenced in the science of attack and defense, an era of which the immense results do not belong only to the period of the Renaissance.